We're here to now for our second oral argument of the day, Conservatorship of Girdis by Jenkins versus Cruz. And it looks like both attorneys are ready. Mr. Thompson, you may begin. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel. The conveyance to Albert Cruz was a gift. And what we're asking the court to do is to continue to protect a person's individual rights to make gifts as they see fit. Janice had previously gifted Albert a one-half interest in the hog site in 2004. Then in 2019, she met with her CPA specifically to discuss gifting her remaining one-half interest, saying that she wanted to give Albert what she believed was his share of her property. At this meeting, she did most of the talking. She was the decision maker. And she went as far as to take an aerial map and to draw out the description and draw out the property lines as she saw fit. She knew what she was doing. She then met with a lawyer, and a deed was drafted on the standard bar form. With her at the time? At the time, yes. Um, it would note that he was a person who was assisting her and driving her lots of places. I'd also note for the record that he is mostly illiterate and does not have much in way of understanding of, of business. Um, Janice was the primary business decision maker. It's unclear that, that he would have understanding of this. There were no contractual terms and no real consideration. Now the district court set aside the conveyance on the grounds of undue influence, finding that there was a confidential relationship that existed between Albert and Janice. In its final paragraph, without any citation to authority, the district court also concluded that there was lack of capacity. Now the Court of Appeals took that last paragraph and ran with it and based its entire decision on lack of capacity without making any reference to the fact that the district court's primary holding was undue influence on the basis of a confidential relationship. I want to begin by discussing the heightened standard that the Court of Appeals applied here in this gift case. Now the standard for lack of capacity is incapability of understanding in any reasonable manner the nature of the transaction and its consequences and effects upon rights and interests. Incapability of understanding is a low standard. But in finding lack of capacity, the Court of Appeals applied a heightened standard, citing Costello to say, we thus follow well-settled law requiring higher mental competence for all transactions other than testamentary transfers. The use of a heightened standard of law for a gift was a misapplication of the law and reversible error. The heightened standard was central to the Court of Appeals' opinion. In the final paragraph, they said, considering the heightened the heightened mental capacity required for inter vivos transfers. So we know that it was central to their decision. Now nowhere in Costello or any other authority by this court does this court apply a higher standard for all inter vivos transfers. What Costello actually found was a higher degree of mental competence is required for the transaction of ordinary business and making contracts than is necessary for testamentary disposition of property. The higher standard is not a generalized category for inter vivos transfers. It is specific only to ordinary business and contracts. But this case involves a gift, a personal transaction, not ordinary business or contracts. The Court of Appeals opinion greatly expanded this court's heightened standard from two specific types of business transactions to all personal inter vivos transfers. This court should not affirm the expansion of the heightened standard from business transactions to personal transactions. Gifts are much more akin to testamentary transfers than they are to business transactions. It strikes me that, that you're, you're hitting on, I think, the, the main point from the district court ruling, which is that, that a confidential relationship existed here. Uh, the Court of Appeals doesn't really rely on that. Uh, why was the district court wrong in finding that as a factual matter? Well, that's addressed. That, that was the primary issue that we briefed. The reason why the district court was wrong is because a confidential relationship relies on dominance, uh, that there is a party that is relying on the other person to be the dominant decision maker in regard to these financial decisions. And the reverse was true in this case. In this case, Janice was the primary decision maker. Albert was essentially illiterate. He was the laborer. She was the one who actually had the dominance in the financial relationship between the two of them. Um, it is discussed in the record how she received all the income from the hog site, despite the fact that they owned a one-half interest. And then she would... They were also 
insurance. I mean, he was unemployed. She would pay, uh, he would drive her around, but then she would pay his bills, uh, buy things for him. I mean, in essence, he was, to some extent, financially living off of her, right? He's unemployed. The record showed that he drove a truck for many years. Um, the, the record certainly doesn't show that he's unemployed. The date of the trial. But as of the date of trial, she had been living out of state for, for a number of months. And he lived at the hog site. He, while there was a third party doing a lot of the daily chores, he was mowing the grass and he was doing care at the hog site as well. Um, in regard to him, her providing him uh, living expenses, it's important to note that despite the fact that they each owned a one-half interest in this hog site, she received all of the income. Their arrangement was that she would then dole out money for his expenses to account for the fact that he had this one-half interest of the hog site. So he got that his half interest, um, not the typical way where you would pay for half the fair market value, right? Honor, it's a gift. And that, that's the point that I'm trying to make here, Your Honor. About how she drew a map and things like that. But how long had she owned the property up to the point of that um, appointment that they had? In terms of the underlying real estate, I, uh, the record's not clear how long she'd owned it. She'd owned it for a long time. I know that in two th known people who are aging in life, and we have a record here showing some professional um, rec uh, summaries of what her state of mind was and what her mental capacity was. But I've known people going through dementia, they can tell you everything that happened from years ago, and they get it correct. Does that necessarily mean that they're doing the, that they're um, cognitively there? I think you need an expert to explain. But who did two different evaluations leading up to the, the date in question, or the, the gift, correct? Well, we have an occupational therapist. I don't know if an occupational therapist has ever been designated as an expert for cognitive issues, nor was the occupational therapist designated as an expert in this case. Occupational therapist uh, records into evidence, correct? Yes, yeah, that was my exhibit. So the district court and the court of appeals could use that evidence as they saw fit. They can use it as they see fit within the bounds of what's appropriate for a layperson. You know, words like dementia. Do any of us know what that means? Can we give a clinical summary of what that means without an expert? Idea of how it affects transactions such as gifts of land. I mean, the evidence you put in actually was quite helpful in my review of this case. There's a lot of uh, issues similar to this where I've never seen that professional of evidence put forward. It actually was quite helpful to understand this woman. So whether you call it dementia or anything else, I think the purpose of it was obviously to assess her, correct? It was to show that she may have, I wanna back up and, and reiterate the fact that this is a clear and convincing case. The purpose of it was to show that uh, an occupational therapist had come to the family and said she may have some minor issues. She may have some of these minor cognitive issues. And if you look at the, the, the assessment by the professional, he begins by saying she should have follow-up assessment to determine what's going on. These records existed a year before the transfer, and yet within that year, the family clearly didn't perceive significant enough issues to follow through with the recommendation to have an actual assessment. I do have one question about the, the uh, record. Um, the amount of money that was generated by the hog site for this, um, for the benefit of Janice and and Albert, it looked to me like it's only about four hundred fifty dollars a month. Is that right, or was it more than that? The Court of Appeals had a much higher number, I think. So, farming can be very complicated when it comes to income and cash flow, and increase in net worth. So I, I do believe the cash flow, once you take into account financing, was relatively low to four or five hundred dollars a month. But in terms of the effect of net worth, we don't have any record of what that was. Pay off farm credit or whoever has the, the loan on the... Uh, yeah, note that a, a lot of the income is going to pay, which has since been paid, which has since been paid off. So I do want to return once again to, to the medical records briefly to, to, to summarize those. <laughs> The inaction of the family, I think, speaks as loud as the action, which was our intent in presenting them. We had, there are medical records from an occupational therapist who stated that she may have minor issues. And it's not clear. There's nothing clear in those records. And yet the family clearly did not perceive enough issues to have her further assessed. She continued to live at home alone um, with just some assistance from... At that point, 
those records were created, had she yet made the gift? It was a year before the gift. I, I'm not surprised at all that the family didn't take the next step. Maybe they never realized there's something impending that's going to impact there and that they're going to need to have a, a more rock solid uh, document. So if it wasn't pending, I guess I don't think it's so shocking. Isn't that enough news for a family to know? We need to be concerned about mom. If we're concerned, hey, mom doesn't know what she's doing, then they would have follow-up assessment. Help her with her financial management. That yes, there was some help in paying bills. Um, the records say, right, that the daughter completes her financial management and pays bills. That seems. There was some help in paying bills. That, doesn't that suggest a concern by the family about the ability of this person to take care of their own finances? I think it's a dangerous standard to say that it, once a parent requests that a child help them pay bills, that they no longer can make gifts as they say fit, that they no longer have competency. I'd also note on the medical records, if you look at page two of the medical records, the only reason why we have them is because Janice Curtis herself, a month after the records were generated, went to the hospital and signed a release. Now, the hospital clearly thought that she was competent to sign a release. That Justice May was asking, I think it's reasonable for family to get an assessment like they did and take action. It doesn't mean it has to be further assessment, but to take action. I also think it's reasonable that a family doesn't want to have their parent or loved one in a conservatorship. There are people out there who do everything under the sun without officially getting conservatorship. So I, I think that your, um, your argument, I, th I think, isn't it reasonable for a family to say what the occupational therapist gave us is enough to know we are activated? We're going to take action and help her, but they don't have to go to court. They don't have to go to another doctor. You go to court and get a conservatorship, but I would certainly think that there would be more steps taken to assess what might be going on. I know that if, my, if I heard that my parent possibly would have dementia from an occupational therapist, I would take them to a cognitive specialist. I would determine from a doctor. Uh, I'm not aware of any ruling that, 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 that would... An occupational therapist is an expert in cognitive care and cognitive assessments. You meant if you felt like she was going to start giving money away. But if there was no indication at that point she was going to make a gift like she did of land, um, would you agree that it's reasonable for someone to also say that's enough evidence for me we're going to take care of her? shows that she was, in the family's mindset, giving money to Albert. They knew that she had this close relationship. And I would point again that she had already given Albert one half interest in this hog site. She had already gifted that to him in the past. So this isn't some gift that's out of the blue. It's following through with the second half of a gift that she had previously given him. Uh, I just have a few minutes. In novo review, shouldn't we defer to the findings of the trial court that heard the witness testimony firsthand? to discuss here in the last couple minutes. The, the trial court made no credibility determinations, nor is there any clear conflict between the testimony of the witnesses. Now, the testimony offered by the conservators' witnesses were nonspecific in time and very generalized. The testimony offered by Albert's witnesses, namely CPA Lemon, were specific to January 9th. So I don't think it's appropriate to do what the appellate court did, what the Court of Appeals did, and imply credibility findings where there isn't any clear implications to be drawn from the district court. The testimony from the sides didn't conflict in any meaningful way, and I think it's also important to understand that the district court's primary holding, the majority of its holding, was done under a flipped burden and standard of proof, where they had held that, that Albert had to prove by clear and convincing evidence that he didn't assert undue influence. And I think that that's a taint in regard to the record that was, wasn't adequately addressed by the Court of Appeals. And so I don't think that there's anything to be drawn from the record that's not explicitly stated in the record um, from the district court. And so Just to briefly end on the heightened standard, because I do think it's applicable specifically to the issue of lack of capacity. On one hand, they're, they're applying a heightened standard saying it's like a business transaction. And then on the other hand, they're saying, we're going to fault it for having lack of consideration. We're going to fault it for having improvidence. What this has created is a situation where a gift in Iowa is the hardest to defend legally. It's the hardest to defend. 
a few minutes ago, you made a comment that the, the second half of the gift was just a completion of the first half. Is there anything in the record to say that's true? There were no strings attached on that first one saying, I'm going to give you this now, and I'll give you the second half later. There, there was nothing like that in the record, was there? My time is up. May I, may I answer the question, Your Honor? It was not my intent to imply that in 2004 there was any clear indication that she intended to give the whole hog site to Albert. So it would have been more accurate for me to say that she followed a previous similar gift, not that she completed a gift that she had any intention of making in 2004. Thank you. Mr. Sander. May it please the court, counsel. Good morning. Going second is always, I don't know, a blessing or a curse. Uh, the presentation that you have kind of goes out the window a little bit. Um, the, for the biggest thing that I would just like to immediately jump into is uh, the, the multiple references that this was a gift. We, we strongly disagree with that. Um, the 2004 initial transfer of interest when the half interest was conveyed had a very important part of that, a notation on that deed that it was a gift. That deed contained the notation that that was a gift to Albert Cruz. By comparison, the 2019 deed did not have that notation. To it is transfer. It wasn't for consideration, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I right. I would not dis. I mean, the law set has contracts and it has gifts. I mean, this was a gift. I would not disagree, Your Honor, with the with the fact that there was no consideration. The record is clear. There was no money provided. Um, but I would, I guess, still disagree that those can be equated to the same things. With respect to the overall view, uh, the, the giving of that interest by that deed was different, is one my main point, from the 2004 situation, uh, significantly, we think. Uh, to dive into that, again, the notation was there. Continuing on, the, the key here uh, in the totality is that Ms. Gerdes continued to have debt obligations on that land at the time of the 2019 deed. Uh, the, the a little bit is, uh, at least about the district court's ruling, is a lot of it seems to be driven by this was a bad idea, this is a, a foolish transaction. Well, people do foolish things. The law lets them, allows them to do that. I mean, don't we really need to focus on whether she understood what she was doing, in terms of capacity, whether she understood what she was doing at the time she did it in 2019. And isn't the most pertinent witness on that the accountant who was there? I think the accountant is certainly the, the, a witness that gave testimony that cannot be obviously disregarded. Um, but again, I, I, I agree with the court statement that we have to look at the uh, the action that was taken. People do things, of course, that don't uh, maybe have a full understanding to a third party when you look at it from the outside. But here, is, this bar is really high, right? I mean, we have said that the person making this deed has to be incapable of understanding in any reasonable manner the nature of the transaction and its consequences and, and effects. And I believe the testimony was when she went in uh, with, was it Mrs. Lemon? Ms. Yeah, Lemon? Your Honor, yes. Uh, that, uh, that, that Ms. Geerdes did all the talking. So it strikes me as difficult to say that she's incapable of understanding. And if she's the one going in and talking to Ms. Lemon, Ms. Lemon seems to understand that, that Ms. Geerdes knew what she was doing and knew what she was saying. So how do we get there on this record? Thank you, Your Honor, for the question. Um, I do think that, again, I'll go back to the totality. On, on one snapshot of that date and time, that was the testimony provided by Ms. Lemon. But if, I, but if I can, I think if you look at the totality of the record and the circumstances, again, the 2017 uh, situation with the accident, 
the records that have been referenced by the court uh, and what those records show, moving forward then to the uh, issues of having the debt on the property. Maybe, I, we were not there. None of us were there, of course, on that date. But the testimony that on that date in front of Ms. Lemon in the I, limited time that that occurred, that Ms. Lemon said she looked like she understood what she was doing to me. I, Fiddity? <laughs> I think that's a term, certainly, that could be used for that. Back, again, a very well point to my totality argument is that given the other nature and the factors that the law has provided to look at, the improvident nature of that transfer, she's, she's obligated on this debt, uh, not only in her, on the land itself and her personally, her other land, she has other farmland that she also had on that debt sec as security. The notion that she would make that with, uh, with full understanding uh, and competence and awareness of what that, those, that transfer was going to mean uh, is one part of that totality of the circumstances. So what would the transfer mean uh, with the debt outstanding on the property? Why, why was it such a bad deal for her? I guess the simplest way I can say that is she's, she's given away all the good and keeping the bad. Uh, she's given away the, the right to have income from that property if it's no longer hers. Time. How old was she at the time? No, no one likes to have a question they know they should know, but they don't. I, I don't remember her age at that time, Your Honor. In her 80s or so, something like that? Yeah, I, I think it's late 70s, 80s. Maybe financially it was bad, a bad decision, but maybe not for an 80-something-year-old woman who has a close relationship with a friend and she doesn't really care about the long-term consequences of the decision because she wants to help this guy who's been living on her property for a long time and drives her around and they start a trucking company. Maybe she just didn't care about the long-term consequences. I mean, isn't that possible? In good faith, I don't know that I can say that it isn't possible. Uh, of course, uh, my client's position is, is strongly opposed to that interpretation. That again, this is a person that did not have the awareness of that and had been. The implication you're making is because it was such a bad deal for her that there had to be, she had to lack capacity. And maybe for somebody at that age and in that physical condition, Maybe the better inference is she really didn't care about the long-term consequences. I mean, it seems like they're both equally plausible, and we don't know. I guess I, the, the view that our client takes is uh, more so that she just didn't care, but that she just uh, uh, didn't know, and also that she was being influenced to do this. Again, what, what the kind of thing. Here's the problem I have with that is, I mean, to prove undue influence, you're supposed to you know, meet that heavy burden if you're the, the plaintiff trying to set aside the transaction, whatever is clear and whatever, you know, whatever clear and convincing, whatever the burden is. But then our cases say, and, and the district court did cite them correctly, I think, that if there's a confidential relationship, then the burden shifts to the other side to disprove that the tra transaction uh, was uh, procured through undue influence by clear and convincing. Well, it seems to me in any of these undue influence cases, the two people are always going to be close. So if that's the law, it seems like you're always going to put the burden on the defendant to prove they didn't do it by clear and convincing evidence, and that seems not right to me. I don't know. that that uh, is very common, the factual pattern, most likely in these situations. But again, using the, the, the common law and the, and the prior decisions that we have, uh, I, I guess I would state maybe, maybe this is not deemed a, t a real difference, but it's the burden is on the plaintiff, clearly. But then uh, that uh, turns into where there's a confidential relationship, then we have a, re a, a presumption, if you will, that there was undue influence the facts that establish a confidential relationship here. Um, the facts as we see them, Your Honor, are that uh, Janice and Albert had a relationship that was very lengthy, long, long, long term. We think that certainly factors in. This isn't like they just uh, met each other and been involved for the last year. 
Um, they had been involved in these business dealings. There's really no dispute about that. They were joint owners of this particular facility. There is re evidence and testimony in the record that uh, Albert had uh, taken action on her behalf with the uh, tenant, Mr. Lubenthal, that he had had contact, contentious contact, but still a contact to be represented uh, for or on her behalf. Uh, th they had been involved monetarily together. There was, this is clearly a contentious situation among the family. I, I don't think that's too hard to, uh, to interpret. Uh, at that uh, Albert and Janice had been together on again, off again. Uh, she had paid things on his behalf. There's record testimony about a credit card issue through Menards and, and, and things that Albert had used the checkbook. Create a close relationship, but what makes it a confidential relationship? Well, I think, Your Honor, the element of the uh, confidentiality, or the, excuse me, the confidential relations side of it is the term that is used in, in the law. And again, uh, the finding was simply that because of all those factors together, that's what arose to that level of relationship that then led to that uh, presumption, if you will, that was rebuttable and was not, according to the district court. I, I concur with my co-counsel that this has taken a little bit of a meandering situation with the way the trial court styled its ruling and the way the appellate court styled its ruling, you know, with one maybe looking at the issue and how it was decided and then the, other, the next court kind of shifting analysis a little bit. I don't think it changes the fact that both the issues of undue, undue influence and uh, capacity are clearly involved. So let me ask you another question. I mean, uh, the, the two sets of records, the, I think they're what, early 2019 and then early 2018, the two sets of records of the cognitive testing that was done on uh, Janice, those are, in, those are both in evidence. But there's no testimony by anybody explaining the significance. So we as judges, as lay people, are now in the position of interpreting them. Does that, does that make a difference? I mean, it, it, it's, to me, usually, I, it seems to me I see these in the context of some professional explaining what, what, the rec, what those kinds of things mean. Um, I, I can understand that, that statement and, and certainly that position, Your Honor. Uh, my suggestion is that the court does that. By the court, I mean a courtroom. A, a judge does that oftentimes with interpretation of records, be they medical, be they other things. I think the law is clear that there's no requirement, the, ca the case law, and there's certainly no statutory requirement that an expert come in, that this was deemed to be medical records, um, that they were admitted. They were, they were admitted by, by the plaintiff. Uh, I think the court would acknowledge that when uh, two parties go to trial, we don't want duplication of matter, so that we knew the records were coming in, they were, they were marked and, and entered in. And so those records were then interpreted or used as part of the totality by the court. Any request by either party that the district court sort of only use them for very limited purposes, or were they just sort of entered into evidence and then the district court gets to decide what to do with them? I, I certainly believe it's the second, Your Honor. I don't believe there are any restriction on the, uh, on the entrance of those records into evidence. They were, they were fully, entirely admitted for consideration by the court. Um, Mr. Cruz, I'm trying to figure out the policy implications of going along with you on this. And was Mr. Cruz sort of obligated when the idea of a gift came up to sort of send Janice to a doctor for an evaluation before receiving the gift? I mean, is that sort of where we're getting at, is that, that potential recipients have to get some sort of professional certification of the, of the gift or's uh, capacity? Well, I, I, I chuckle because I think of that in, in a sense of the legal world. It's a certainly a fair question. Um, I, I think I can only bring myself back to, to the facts of this case in that uh, the obligations of Mr. Cruz, uh, I think according to the law, are not to take advantage of a person. Uh, and in this case, that's what we think happened, both in terms of the undue influence and the lack of, uh, lack of capacity that was involved here. He had a clear advantage here 
with the relationship that these two people had had over years. He, he drove Janice to the accountant. Uh, we can say the record reflects that she did all the talking. Well, at the same time, it's, it's in the record that Mr. Cruz apparently claims he's not very understanding of the ink. I, I think it, I think there was ebb and flow to the to the family relationship. I think the record shows that Laura had been involved with uh, Janice for many number of years before the deed in question, with respect to helping her on the financial side, paying bills. Again, there was that incident that had to be dealt with. With uh, now we have a judgment situation with uh, Albert uh, purchasing things, uh, uh, kind of through Janice or through Menards, and so yeah, there was an ebb and flow of contact. But I think the record clearly shows uh, that these things were occurring well before the deed in question. I see my time is up. Uh, I thank the court for the opportunity. We would ask the court to, to affirm both the trial court and the appellate court rulings. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. So Justice Oxley, I want to address the confidential relationship. I want to direct the court's attention to Groves, which is a case this court decided, where it said the relationship between a mother and son, which it found closer than most relationships between mothers and sons, in a farming situation was not a confidential relationship. On the first day that we had trial in this case, the Court of Appeals issued an opinion in the Hindeman case analyzing a confidential relationship in the context of a husband and wife where the husband was a farmer and the wife had much less knowledge of the finances of the farming operation. There, the Court of Appeals also found that there was not a confidential relationship because confidential relationship relies on dominance and the opposite of dominance. And in this situation, Janice was the person who had financial dominance. Now, in regards to the financing, the financing remained on the hog site, and Janice continued to own over 100 acres of farmland. So I don't believe the record's clear that this had any... Was Albert on the debt, too, or not? He wasn't, but the debt... But it's a mortgage. It ran with the land. I, I actually believe he, he... I believe he was. It's not in the record, because he was a half-owner. Um, potentially, lastly, I just want... I want to address a concern that I have in this case, a concern that I, I just feel in the Court of Appeals' opinion. And that is that the Court of Appeals talked about lack of capacity, but I think undue influence was hiding behind the curtain. I think it was. And I think it's important that we not analyze them together. So what I want to ask you to do when you go back in chambers and to consider this case is, instead of Albert, consider in the record, with what the medical records say, and the lack of clarity they have, Consider instead if Janice had gone to her CPA with, say, her pastor or the administrator of her hospital and had said, I want to make a gift to my church or my hospital. And this is what I want. And she does most of the talking, most of the decision making. She takes an aerial photograph. She draws the description. She draws the lines on the map. And she says, I want to make this transfer to this organization because I care about this organization. I want you to consider that. Because I have a concern that even though we're talking about undue influence, or that we're talking about lack of capacity, that undue influence is behind the curtain, and that it's whispering under the floorboards. And I think that we need to not listen to it. I think we need to analyze undue influence as undue influence. And we need to analyze lack of capacity as lack of capacity. And that we certainly... Reverse, we have to address both issues. Why, why was the dissent on the Court of Appeals uh, the, the better reasoned? Well, it's just obvious from reading, from reading it. Um, I think because it was a more thorough analysis. I believe also because it specifically addressed the issues with implied credibility. Even though there, I don't think that it was clearly addressed the fact that there was no clear contradictions between the credibility of the witnesses. Um, you know, in my application for further review, I, I referred to the dissent a lot. I just found it. 
are two pretty good opinions, and we're going to have to come up with a third, right? <laughs> and I agree with that, and I also think the majority did a very good job in establishing the facts. So I think they did a great job in establishing the facts. Um, clearly, I disagree with their decision and have great concerns with the fact that now under Iowa law, a gift is the hardest to defend. It's harder than a business transaction. There's heightened scrutiny of medical capacity and automatic fault for lack of consideration. It's the two horsemen of the gift apocalypse. And so, Your Honors, I ask that you carefully review the case, that you consider, in terms of lack of capacity, how, you would, how would you view it if it was made to somebody other than Albert, somebody other than an illiterate immigrant, say, a charitable organization, and that you reverse the decision of the district court and of the Court of Appeals? And with that, Your Honors, I will surrender the rest of my time. Thank you for your consideration. Case of um, conservatorship of Janice Gerdes is hereby submitted, and the court will take a brief recess before the third and final oral, oral argument of the morning. And the lawyers can go ahead and get situated.